5,000 years ago. Somewhere off the coast of West Australia was an event that triggered an Indian Ocean mega tsunami, crashing enormous waves into the coast of West Australia, dislocating huge boulders and leaving a wave of sand meters deep and kilometers wide across the entire prehistoric West Australian coastline. In this episode, we examine the entire length of West Australia's Indian Ocean coastline, looking for evidence to help locate the epicenter of an Indian Ocean mega tsunami. West Australia has tsunami indicators along the entire Indian Ocean coastline. Evidence is mainly in the form of sand dune deposits oriented in the direction of wave travel known as tsunami chevrons. In this episode, we explore multiple chevron locations along Australia's west coast to get a better understanding of how and where West Australian Indian Ocean tsunamis are generated. Western Australia is a tectonically stable region, far from distant plate boundaries and associated earthquake and volcanic activity, which we can largely rule out. And yet, this coast has more tsunami deposits than anywhere else on the planet, with many features that point to an obvious source. But we start in Japan. On March the 11th, 2011, Japan experienced one of the most destructive tsunami events in living memory. The tsunami was triggered by the most powerful earthquake at magnitude 9 ever recorded in Japan. The epicenter was just off the northeastern coast of Honshu, Japan's main island. We're throwing landfill and mountains, rocks out here. Run-up heights were at the extreme end of the expected range for an earthquake-triggered tsunami, in some cases overwhelming 10-metre-high seawall defences. At Sendai, the tsunami waves travelled up to 10 kilometres inland. The city of Miyako, located in Owase Prefecture, experienced waves many times higher than they expected for an earthquake-generated tsunami, even an earthquake as powerful as this. A study by the University of Tokyo found tsunami wave run-up heights up to 40 metres above sea level, a mega-tsunami. As well as immense property damage, 512 people died in Mayako. Research concluded this earthquake triggered an undersea landslide off the coast of Iwate, compounding a large tsunami into a mega tsunami. The earthquake was the catalyst, but the continental slope landslides generated the biggest waves. Tsunamis can be triggered by earthquakes, landslides into water, volcanoes, and even asteroid impacts. But to create an open ocean mega tsunami, it takes an undersea landslide on the edge of the continental shelf. Other regions also experienced similar continental slope tsunamis. In some cases, these events occurred in otherwise tectonically stable locations. For example, the North Sea and North Atlantic near Scotland and Norway. Approximately 8,000 years ago was an event called the Storega Landslide, which left tsunami deposits all around the North Atlantic, including in Scotland and Norway. How does this information help locate the origin of West Australian Indian Ocean mega tsunamis? Let's look at the evidence. We begin by examining a series of sand dunes between the towns of Dalio and Stratham, 10 kilometres to the south of Bunbury, in the southwest of Western Australia. We also answer the question, what is a tsunami chevron? A tsunami chevron is a sand dune deposit generally consisting of two parallel ridges which come to a point in the same direction as the wave travel. The wave swash pushed the sand inland, forming the initial ridges and point of the chevron, which was then further scoured by the backwash as the seawater retreated. Some West Australian chevrons are over a kilometre long. Tsunamis are often multiple wave flood events. Second and third inundations are often even higher than the initial wave, a fact that should be understood by anyone ever caught up in a tsunami. The Dalyup dunes demonstrate the multiple wave events very clearly, with at least three separate overlaying chevrons with the same orientation and likely from the same event. Bisecting the angles clearly shows the direction of wave swash. 
The chevrons show tsunami waves travelling from the Indian Ocean to the west and moving overland due east. Three kilometres to the south are the dunes at Minimup Beach near the town of Stratham. These are some of the most important and interesting dunes on the entire West Australian Indian Ocean coastline. At first glance, these dunes are unassuming and even bland, but answer important questions about the mega tsunami source and about the lack of dunes along Geograph Bay. The dunes at Minimup Beach are the first tsunami deposits north of the Cape to Cape region and the most southerly on the Perth coastal plain. This is the first and smallest dune. The dunes get progressively bigger to the north and peak about one kilometer along the coast. The sand wave snout is so clear there is no need to mark it on the video. But why do the dunes stop at this location? There appears to be a wave shadow effect caused by the headlands of Cape Naturaliste, sheltering Geograph Bay from Busselton to Dunsborough. The tsunami event appears to have missed this area completely. So today I'm at Minimup Beach, which is in near a small town called Stratham, which is a few miles to the southwest of Bunbury in the southwest of Western Australia. And uh, just to exactly to the west of me over there is Cape Naturaliste. And obviously we've done a lot of exploring up and down the Cape to Cape um, region along the Lewin Ridge to Cape Naturaliste. Uh, but this is the first time I've actually explored the dunes around Bunbury. Now this is a really important spot for the story because about a kilometre down to the southwest from me here is the very first place where the waves hit during the tsunami that was north of the Cape to Cape region. It seems like Cape Natural East, a few kilometres over the bay, was actually formed a, a wave shadow which prevented all of the waves from around um, uh, Dunsborough and Busselton. None of those places actually have any sand dunes and the very first sand dunes um, to the north of the Cape to Cape region are about a kilometre to the southwest of me right now. So, interesting location. Wave shadow sheltering was also seen during the December 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami, especially in Thailand. There were several bays, with a tsunami inundation to one side of the bay, and hardly any effects just a few hundred metres away inside the same bay. Wave shadowing of this kind is also seen along the West Australian coast north of Perth, in places such as Kalbari and Dongara, as seen on Google Maps. The shadowing phenomenon shows the fickle unpredictability of tsunamis. Other locations can be subjected to wave refraction and reflections, with tsunami waves moving in entirely different directions from their origin, and sometimes even combining together to greater heights in what is known as constructive interference, all of which was experienced by the Indian regions of Tamil Nadu and Kerala during the December 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami. Back to Minimup in Western Australia. Minimup dunes could be remnants of the same larger dunes found immediately to the north that were eroded by the ocean, but the lack of other dunes around Geograph Bay suggests that these are not erosion remnants but do represent the edge of a tsunami inundation. Evidence for either was washed away millennia ago, although there is little current active erosion. A lack of current erosion points more though to the wave shadow edge theory. Historic Google Earth imaging indicates little or no change for the last few decades. Sadly, there is much human activity in the region which can be seen by the housing developments. Any human activity obliterates such fragile tsunami evidence. Next, we look at an area we studied in previous episodes, the Margaret River Cape to Cape region. Lewin Ridge and Hamlin Bay have many tsunami chevron dune deposits, all with an identical easterly pointing aspect. From all of these southwest locations, we get an obvious bearing of waves traveling from the west and heading due east. 
We now need to compare several other Chevron Dune locations in order to triangulate a possible tsunami source. Australia's most westerly point is Hartog Island, a remote and difficult to reach location, so we rely here on Google Maps. Chevrons are oriented with apexes pointing due north. Directional evidence is clear and obvious, allowing us to draw a line on the map heading from due south. We already have excellent location pointers, but what about some intermediate directional evidence? This is exactly what we find part way between Perth and Hartog. At Beekeepers Reserve, just north of Lehman, and some 40 kilometers further north at Carson's Beach, are some intermediately angled chevrons. This region also has a number of wave shadow areas free from chevrons, which also fit our overall theory. Draw a line correlating with the chevrons and wave shadows, and we find an almost perfect match and agreement with our other indicators. Google Earth clearly shows where the lines meet. The unusually extensive continental shelf off the coast of Western Australia's southwest Cape to Cape region, an undersea feature called the Natural East Plateau. We should also take a look around the coast towards South Australia and even as far as King Island, Tasmania for other chevron dunes which also corroborate a Cape to Cape continental slope epicentre theory. One final piece of evidence we look at in this episode is the sand layer along Loon and Boron Bridges in the southwest Cape to Cape area. With an elevation of over 220 metres above sea level, we may be looking at the highest tsunami deposits on planet Earth. I'd make a guess the undersea landslides were centred on this area, but likely spread out along the region many kilometres to the north and south. Strictly speaking, tsunamis do not actually have an epicentre, but I think the term fits in this case study, and this is its location. In the next episode, we look at rivers, lakes and wetlands and study how these geographical features were affected by and what they can tell us about past tsunami events. Stay tuned!